for me, iconic was about having the right architect who had a, had a great body of work of which I could then um, photograph an example. But the house had to break some new ground. It had to be a different way of living for that time, whether it was something lightweight in Queensland or something monumental in Victoria. It, it had to feel like it moved the language of architecture on somewhat. So in some senses, I didn't find the houses, the houses found me. And I did start always with the, the point of view of who is the right architect. Um, and, and from the architect then tried to source a house. Because it's important, you can have a great house from someone who's just had a, had a one-off. And I didn't want it to be that. I wanted it to be architects that were really shaping um, kind of groundbreaking domestic spaces in Australia at their respective times. Oh, where do we start? <laughs> the, the planning as such was first that we had to have major zones and functionalism and planning were very strong to both our minds. The planning had to work. So we had a, a living zone which was to the left of the main entrance and we had a sleeping zone which was to the right of the main entrance and the so-called work zone which was the kitchen and bathroom and things. So they were clearly defined I think. We had no money with a war service home loan and the idea was to try and make the house appear psychologically as big as we could and that's where we came up with various ideas to hopefully achieve that. The initial response to the site wasn't as sympathetic as this house was, it was much more dramatic uh, and I was trying to create a house which was very much contemporary and which used contemporary materials, steel and concrete and glass and <coughs> had some human expression, which was my big criteria, I suppose. Fortunately, I think the house didn't go ahead. It was too expensive. And uh, we came up with this design, and it, it did revert to traditional materials to gain what I called human expression. And I was a strong contemporary, hopeful architect, and strongly believed in all the theories of the time. But I felt that the houses particularly were lacking something. Uh, there was no detail, there was no uh, little bit of human touches and consequently I felt they were cold. Uh, and decoration had become a dirty word. Largely because I think the, the, the modern movement came about as a reaction to Victorianism and the high, huge amount of decoration to the decoration became almost more important than the architecture in which it was based. Uh, so I wanted to add a little humanity, that was really as simple as that. Well, I actually fell in love with this particular house. Um, in 1996, I um, worked on an exhibition for Sydney Living Museums. I was on a, a research panel and we all got divvied up, you know, different buildings to research and it just so happened that I, this was one of them. And I absolutely fell in love with that whole idea of the sighting and over the creek and, and Russell's use of decoration. Um, it, it was became my dream house, it's extraordinary. And Russell became sort of like my mentor. So yes, yeah, so this house has been really, you know, in my psyche since 1996, it's, it's extraordinary. It's like living in nature. We live on this creek and, you know, the house just opens up. It's like being in a tree house, really. You know, when you look out the window, you're very much, you know, really connected to nature. So it's beautiful. And, and having my daughter in the house, you know, the house is so beautifully designed, this L shape that, you know, with all the glazing, that no matter where I am in the house, even if I'm doing my own thing, I can still see my daughter. So there's this fantastic idea that we can connect and still see each other visually, but we're not living on top of each other. Um, and then the only thing I've done in, in relation to actually um, reinstating something is there are some louvers in the master bedroom and I decided to reinstate them. Russell had had them originally there but they weren't functioning so um, so Russell and I and another gentleman who's a um, furniture designer and he got Glenn Merkett involved and there are quite a few people involved and anyway we came up with a new system and I got some new louvers made and we stained them and it's beautiful. It was sort of the only thing in the house that wasn't working the way it was meant to and it's just gorgeous and I think Russell's really happy now too. I often felt the house in many ways was a background uh, to various forms of interior treatment. I must be careful not to say decoration. Uh, <laughs> uh, and it reflects one's personalities a bit, I think. And Annalise's personality is different from mine. Uh, and she's been able to, I think, to, to make those changes. 
I mean, there's more colour in it now than we had, but then I have to remember that we had some pretty violent colours in that sitting room ourselves from time to you time. You did, you took them all down. Yes, but we you took them down. So we've, orange you know, walls. We, and... Yes, yes. So the, I think the house can take it. It was a major part of my life was spent here, and the happiest part of my life, you know, with a, a, fi a wonderful marriage and wonderful children and superb dogs <laughs> <laughs> and opportunities for me to carry out what few hobbies I had, which was mainly playing with the house and carpentering and bricklaying in the garden. And there's so much we put into it uh, that it's wonderful to think it's all understood and loved. I was working in my father's office, I was a student, I was doing fourth year, and I was sent out to do a survey on the hillside here. I did the survey of the site, and then I saw all this land down below that, that particular block. So I slid down the, the mountain, because there was no access to it whatsoever, and the slope was 45 degrees, and I walked all over the whole place, I just couldn't believe it. I'd, I'd grown up here in Kew, uh, and swimming in the Arrow River, so I was absolutely in love with the whole site. Uh, I was at that stage which architectural students get to where they hate suburbia. I loathed and hated suburbia. Uh, <laughs> I just, and this was like a, a, a Shangri-La, uh, Arcadia, you know, something completely away. When I was here, it was as if I wasn't even in Melbourne. So it was a, it was a romance. And then when I came to do this, this particular building, this is a 40-foot cantilever, it's all in imperial dimensions. So I knew that 40 foot cantilever, how am I going to do this? And I found a part of the site where I could get the view down both arms of the river and I was able to cantilever on both directions. You know, so the one 40 foot cantilever balanced the other 40 foot cantilever. That's how I did it. The reason why Tuxen, the surveyor, said you can't build on this, it's too steep, is because he was thinking of it conventionally about a conventional Australian suburban house. Uh, the whole point about modernism was that we had new materials to be able to respond to all sorts of unusual circumstances. Uh, and that's what was demonstrated in this house, using steel, making the, the form, the design of the house, the structural idea behind it made the shape of the house. So we let this, the structure make the shape of the house, which made it look unusual. We didn't mind that because it was a solution, a modern solution to a problem. I was so imbued with the structure that I didn't pay great attention to the actual... I, I, was, I wasn't married when I designed this house. What actually happened is that uh, uh, my wife, Dione, came into the office after I had designed it and was documenting it, uh, and, and she was working on the working drawings of it. Uh, so I designed it as a bachelor. Uh, so uh, it wasn't a house designed for a family. I wasn't even thinking of about a family. So she said to me, uh, well, the design of the house, how, where are the best, what, you know, how's it going to be used? So I said to her, look, uh, uh, we were, our office was in Sigilda Road, so I said, please come out into the Faulkner Park at the back. We sat on the, the stool and I proposed marriage to her. And uh, she, she agreed to get married. So we went back inside and I said, this will be our bedroom and so forth. But of course, what, we, what she had no experience with, nor did I, uh, we very quickly had four children. And uh, this house is totally unsuitable for four children. Uh, so I had to adapt it and extend it. So the flow of the house and the layout of it is for a bachelor's house. Well, the favorite thing about it at the moment is that my daughter is now living in it. That, that's because she's bringing it back to life. I mean, that, that's what I like about it most of all. I come and have breakfast with her or something like that, and it's, it's lovely. <laughs> well, I equate architecture and music. And music is volume and architecture is space. Different people like different kinds of music. Intuitively. Uh, and what it is, I think, that they find or they love about the music that they like is it strikes a chord with them. And I think architecture is the same. I think if there's any enduring interest in a house or a piece of architecture, it's, it's that it has struck a chord with the observer. When uh, Bob had uh, took me to the site, in those days, it was very pristine. There were very few houses. It was a beautiful site. It had a lovely aspect, northern aspect. 
and I spent a lot of time on that site learning and discovering its little secrets in a, in a, in a way. I'd only really just recently been introduced to Frank Lloyd Wright's work, for example, and of course it struck an accord with me. Uh, I liked its architecture, but didn't mean to say that I attempted to copy his architecture, but I think it might have had an influence on me in this particular occasion. The condition of my employment as architect was to provide the documentation and the design, not to supervise. But he allowed me five supervision visits at uh, 10 shillings a visit. I arrived one day and found this whole stack of red bricks. And awful, I mean, I hated them. But he had bought them cheaply and he decided to build them into the house. Um, naturally, I tried to make them, to soften them in some way. And I devised the idea of when the bricklayer laid the bricks, he was to squash the mortar out and not wipe it clean. And that became known as snotted brickwork. <laughs> It would have been a completely different house if it had been built in Sydney sandstone. And that was my disappointment, but that was a big lesson for me. So I never ever accepted a, a project unless I had full supervision. I never intended to be radical. I mean, I just wanted to be, I just wanted to design buildings appropriate and give integrity to the site. They were always site specific. It's what I'm all about, actually, in the end. Robin actually said in some of his writings that it was an architect's responsibility to test ideas in his own buildings, in his own house. So I think in this case, Robin has pushed the boundaries, probably a little further than he would do in other houses. So instead of putting the house in the middle of the land, so what Robin has done is he's pushed the house out to the boundaries and basically taken that poorly used land from outside the house and put it into the centre of the house, creating this magnificent courtyard we have here. The courtyard is, in effect, the heart of the house. So we've got a very small house here, but all the major rooms look into the courtyard so they appropriate the space and feel much bigger than they actually are. The, the roof here at Wall Street is essentially a simple skillion roof. But because of the, the long spans, um, he's used cables. He has two steel beams, one at each end of the house, and these cables are slung between the beams. And then the ceiling consists of floorboards, tongue groove pine floorboards that are laid on top of the cables. Then there's two layers of canite, and then a bituminous membrane, membrane on top of that. So in all intensive purposes, it's a tent. When it's windy, the roof moves. It talks, it's very volatile. You, know, you hear it creaking, you hear it moving. When you walk on it, it's like a trampoline. Um, and it's still intact 50 years later. It doesn't leak. And it's very, very dramatic, very beautiful, but you know, very simple design, very bold. The other aspect of the house that's important is that it's basically two separate buildings on either side of the courtyard. One building for he and Patricia and one building for the children. Patricia told me a story once that Robin had actually designed a very different house here on the front of the site. He was in their earlier house, which was a very small house out in Camberwell, working on the plans. It was Christmas holidays and he had three young children running around the house making a hell of a racket. Apparently he just lost it, picked the drawings up, screwed them up, threw them on the floor and sat there redesigning the house and came up with this house. Two separate buildings, one for he and Patricia, one for the kids. It's, it's interesting with Robin and Patricia, their whole married life, they didn't ever have a bedroom. The space upstairs you first enter is the formal living room. It's the party room. 
the social room. But when the house was just Robin and Patricia's, it was the bedroom. So the front part of this house is effectively a very sophisticated bed sit, totally open plan. The upper floor is a platform floating within the box. But when you're on that platform, you're aware of the rest of the house. The sound moves around the house. So it reflects Robin and Patricia's lifestyle, Robin and Patricia's relationship, a very close couple. Probably many people couldn't live in this house because you can't really get away from your partner. You know, the sound moves around the house. Um, to them, that was an advantage. To other people, it may not be. And then... Always saying that architecture should be full of wonder. Right? And it's for you visiting architecture that you should be questioning the architecture itself and say, but why that? And because you wonder about whatever you, you feel. So in that respect, architecture should be wonderful, right? full of wonder. With my wife, we came to Sydney in, in I think it was June or July of 55 for the exhibition, to stay for six weeks. Coming to Canberra at that time, I said, that one is, that one is my place. No, not because the future could have been good for building, but because it was, I would say, completely completely a void, you know, completely no history, nothing. And the camera was perfect. Total void, uh, fantastic light, this silence that was like music, you know, you're coming from Europe, you, every time you want to design something, they said, oh, no, but you cannot do that because one thing and another, because someone there, have left some, some ruin from 2,000 years ago, you cannot touch them, all sorts of things. And you are really op op oppressed by, the, by that. I was. And so arriving here and say, oh, everyone is, everything is, is clear, is tabula rasa, was fascinating, and that's what I was saying, that Canberra was the ideal place to be. Dingo House, uh, first of all, uh, is on a, on a road, it's a cul-de-sac, and is facing the golf course. Right, so imagine that one. All the previous few houses on that street, they were facing the street. That is an old fashion of design. My position of the plan was to turn the 90 degrees, say, against the street. And you have a view and the orientation that is pointing in one direction, that was what the golf course. A uh, client are as important or in designing the house as the architect. Remember that design is, is not something that, that is easy to explain, you know. You, you dare and you think something and you say, all right, we do it, oh, it's, it's crazy, so what? In actual fact, if the client is happy, I'm happy, that is how the design is coming. Client uh, at the Dingle House, <coughs> they really didn't know what to expect. I've been able to convince them that the volume of that house, and remember that it's a small house in relation, it's 1950s, 60s houses, they were quite limited in, um, in costs. It was a magnificent time to design houses, but you had to be very strict with, with costs. Looking back at the Dingle house, I'm quite happy. I mean, that house is still, is still functioning and, and being appreciated by the, 
by the user, which are not the original client, but by the user, architecture is produced by the user and not by the architect at the end. You know, uh, an unhappy person in one of my buildings makes my building unhappy, right? So um, that is how I'm looking at Dinkelhaus is good. Well, the Marshall House was was for us such a tremendous find because I ha I knew nothing about while I was working in the kind of magazine lifestyle sector where we did feature a lot of in houses and interiors and so forth. I didn't have an understanding of Australian architecture, so my reaction to this house was intuitive rather than from a from a, a point of oh, it's a, a Bruce Rickard house. I just a friend had shown me pictures, and we came on the first open day, so it was actually. Um, which I think is a good thing. The response was immediate and intuitive rather than intellectual. I think what is most distinctive about the house is that there's no front door. So um, it's a kind of wall of, of doors um, glazed um, all to the, the north because um, Bruce Ricard was all about orientation for light and so he was determined that you would get maximum winter sunlight. And so you come down quite a steep hill and then you turn into this very open friendly face of the house which is a you know a courtyard that faces north it gets the sun and then it's a very open space so the planning is you know living dining and kitchen and he's clever he doesn't want the kitchen he always said i don't want the mess of a kitchen to be exposed so it's actually hidden behind the brick which is kitchen on one side and the fireplace on the other so it's one very simple solution to those two issues and then you go through to um, a deck um, and that's where you you see the view so there is a sandstock brick wall because the house faces west so that then it doesn't get too hot so when i was there on the open day people were saying oh well obviously you would knock this wall through and and what people don't realize is that then you would need air conditioning to, to counteract the heat from the westerly sun and so forth so this house isn't air conditioned it's all about through through breezes. It, it's interesting when you live in a house before I'd spoken to Bruce and before, as I worked on this architectural um, project, I actually appreciated him more because I, I could kind of begin to see the layers of things that, that he'd done. And often they're very simple and quite economical. So above the beds, there is a, a timber shelf and underneath there are two light bulbs that you screw in and you just, that's your reading light. So he's he's been, very interesting with how he's dealt with light in, in even in a, a big continuous space like this one because different switches control um, different lights so you just have pools of light it doesn't need to be lit in a in a blanket fashion all the time so there are those subtleties all of the the, the things in the house are there for a reason. Um, there, there isn't any indulgence they're there to look beautiful or to actually be functional. Well, the children, as they grew up, became very conscious that it was a very particular house and they'd go to their friends and they'd want, they'd come back and go, why can't we have a sort of 60 inch TV screen and why don't we have a swimming pool? And, um, and then as they began to get older, they be became quite protective of it and they really understand it. And I think they're very proud of it. And what um, Bruce is very clever at is that connection with nature. So, you know, the sky and the changing skies are very much a part of daily life. And, and the children will go, Mum, this is a lovely sky. Do you think it's good enough to Instagram? You know, they want, they understand that there is beauty in, in that observation. And I think that's quite a powerful thing, actually, to pass on to your children. What's interesting is that the people before us had three boys, so it's a robust house, you know, people have grown up in it and, and we have been here now for nearly 14 years, so people stay a long time. And it will be interesting to see what, what happens in the future. I can see someone else um, coming in and putting their own things in and, and I like that actually, I like the idea that it has a, you know, continued appreciation and, and use, but it's very hard to control those things after you've gone. I think all the buildings I've done, I've encountered or created or stumbled on uh, uh, the notion that there has to be a big idea. I, I think um, 
it's it's not universal in art that there needs to be a big idea, but it certainly helps. Something that uh, the beach was was built in um, 1985, six that area. Well, as a house, both as a weekender and potentially a kind of retirement house. Uh, so it was very casual. The, the Palm Beach site was really a monster. It had, it had one creek running across it and another vigorous creek running down one side with a major waterfall. And um, it was in a slip area. And the part of the land in which you could build was very, very limited. Fairly early in the piece, I concluded it had to be a little tower rather than a long house. So it, it started small in plan and developed from there. It had a couple of um, strong ideas in it, I suppose. Um, uh, one was that to be in a sort of um, an evocation of the glassed-in veranda, the traditional glassed-in veranda that I'd spent, spent a lot of time in my childhood in, for various relatives had them. What I felt was interesting about glassed-in verandas is that you couldn't combine them with a balcony. Um, so I put the balcony beside the house instead, and partly behind it, um, rather than in front of the room. They were quite small rooms, everything was small. Um, and the bathroom was, our bathroom was a bit like a, a bathroom on a yacht. A fairly simple kitchen. Uh, a lot of the cooking was done outside on a barbecue and under the sala, in the sala. The room, the room was the, the top floor, which was glass all round. And um, it was a big glassed in veranda with a high ceiling and a loft as you remember, looked down over it. And that room was really what it was all about. Having a loft in which, which would overlook the main room, given the room was very high, and given the idea of the house being a staircase to get up the cliff, you then went up to the loft and the loft then opened onto a bridge which, opened, which led back onto the top of the cliff. You know, there was a sort of game there that, that was worth ex exploiting. And the joke we used to make was that um, we figured that the grandchildren would, would live up there most of the time. But in fact, it was the, it was the children who uh, took over the loft most often and grandchildren were, were sent to the, to the little rooms down below. <laughs>
and that's a sort of a crazy reason, but seemed a good idea at the time. I wanted to make the distinction between the ocean side and the other side. I didn't want the house to just be sitting in the landscape. I wanted to feel, it. From, from one side, it was just a wall in the landscape, but from the other side, I just couldn't imagine that it was like a wall on the other side and you drove up a driveway and there was a wall on the other side. It didn't seem enough, because I guess as a practice, we've always, always been very interested in that entry and arrival and things like that. But I just like the idea of you, you come in the driveway, you can't see anything but then just see the, the hint of the two sloping walls that just mark where you go. And people are quite surprised. They drive their car in and they suddenly, they've arrived, they're here and they can't sort of get their head around it. It's only when they sort of walk in and see the view and say, wow, this is a great view that <laughs> they've arrived. And to be honest, I did, I'm digressing here, but at one stage I did think the courtyard, I, you know, maybe I thought one day it might have an olive grove in it or I might grow vegetables in it or do something in it, but, you know, I came to love <laughs> nothing in it. And, um, and I wanted, I've always been interested in I guess metal. I know as kids we used to make spear guns and we'd make guns and things out of metal and we'd file metal and we'd drill it and we'd rivet it and do all this sort of stuff. And I sort of like, I guess it's sort of turned out that I like architecture that you can actually sort of understand how it's built. You can see the pieces that it puts it together. So I, I wanted to use sort of you know, just a really simple palette, just the concrete and then sheets of galvanised hot dip steel and you bring, it's as though you bring them in, you bolt them together, you assemble the things and of course it's also good because it's the sort of stuff you can do yourself. You obviously you have to get the sheets made and cut and to size and galvanised but then you get them in and you can, you can actually just assemble the whole thing. What I don't like so much is that even hot dip galvanised steel starts to, <laughs> starts to rust in places after 30 years when the water doesn't get to it to wash off. So I've had to, I've had to try and patch up a few, few bits and pieces. I really, when I did this house, I really never thought of it being, um, becoming well known. And it's funny, it's, it's sort of, it's being published in so many places, not, not because it's great architecture or anything, it's sort of in a strange way, it's because it's interesting. It's sort of, it's sort of underground way before a lot of houses were underground. It seems environmental and it's sort of simple and not the normal sort of yeah. thing that you, you, you do. And so that was, that was sort of reassuring when yeah. people liked it. And the only plan, as I was saying earlier, that I've had or that I can now recognise is this, this idea about crafting things and making things in metal and being able to understand things because it's the way I would, I would make them I, and, and that's the way I plan buildings. It's all as if, it's, it's all as it's something I can get my head around. Uh, that's why they're not so complex, anything I do. <laughs> well, the first time we saw the site um, was 10 years before we started to build. The most gorgeous thing about it was that the centre of the site was full of amazing trees. So that was important. We saw that as a room in itself. It has to be, I think, uh, understood as um, that the terrain is the house and that one can sort of lay out in the, under trees and on the decks. And it's really like a campsite in that respect. And, it is possible to occupy the site most times of the year out of doors. And so there was this opportunity and interest in uh, locating positions where the last of the afternoon sun in winter would, would fall and where the light comes in in the morning. And so if you could be high and look out to see uh, what the moon was doing. So there's just that interest in being out of doors and therefore there are only really two rooms to, into which to retreat when the weather is, is um, cold and windy and wet. We knew that the power of the horizon was so great that it would be a wonderful thing to explore setting that view up from the back of the site so that we chose to place the house to one side so that there's only a very small part of the 
house has a big view to the ocean. The timber that we use and the, and the trees outside have a relationship. The house is part of the material quality of the landscape. And in the way that the tree has the trunk and the branches and the stems and the twigs, the house has some of those components much more formalised within it. Part of the interest is in the way that we can live closer with the surroundings. It seemed to us also that that occurs in association with things that we might have experienced in childhood or in our imagination. So to suggest that a, an outpost in among the trees at this high level deck, that it might be somehow a nest or a basket, preferably a nest, uh, and because it's quite tight space, um, uh, came about in an interesting way in which it was built without that first. And then walking around and thinking about it and seeing it sitting there, understanding that in order for it to be a special place and not an extension of, an, of a, a much bigger space that's out of range, that it needed actually some way to have this metaphoric value as well as a, a shape to, to define it. And people are surprised when they come there to see how small it is and also that it's not, it's not, um, it's quite rough in parts and, and uh, very uh, simple. But I think people who do visit it who are, are struck by the light, the use of the, of the way that its transparency works, but also its containment and um, the definition of the outside space is it's light-handed but it's there. All the places are shaped and form is given, all the dimensions are there but it's not, none of it is um, insistent in spatial terms and uh, I think people are dreamers and there's a child there. Even the most hard-nosed come away saying, well, it's just like a kid's treehouse, what are you up to? And others go, oh, this is a place I could settle into. So there are different responses and it's not for everybody, but it does appeal to the, the dreamer, I think. I think this was probably the first building that we did, this is 20 years old now, where the fullness of our ideas came together. This kind of was the turning point in many ways with our career because the outcome was a fairly significant outcome. And it's a very monolithic house, it's a big house. We're interested in seeing the negative spaces that are created in a site becoming positive spaces. So instead of a building sitting on a block with a front yard and a backyard, we're interested in the idea that the side spaces become the internal spaces or become the positive spaces. So the building cuts right through the entire space, moving in and out of uh, the space of the, of the site. Uh, and it's the unexpected is quite interesting, so that the view out towards the garden, if the garden comes steps right into the house. The house is split with blades of glass so the light cuts through the middle of the house and there's a whole uh, nuance and layering of effects and experiences. So we want it, the client and anyone who's moving through it or living in it would experience house. I think if you go to someone who, is, who, who can design, you ask them to design and, and it wasn't, it, it was intended to be their design and as long as it fitted how we wanted to live, um, it was up to them to design the structure. And I think that, that um, that's certainly been achieved. And, and, and to, to listen to Randall talk about the design of the house today, he said the same things before it was built. And so it's not that he's saying that now because you can walk through and you can see the light, you can see um, the structure. Um, it was designed to be like that and the most amazing thing to me was that's what happened. Um, it ended up being built the way it was designed to be built. We like the idea that our houses are coming out of the ground in a solid way rather than touching the earth lightly. 
And that's partly, I think, being from Melbourne, but also there's something to do with permanence. And um, if you look at the heritage, the colonial heritage that we've inherited in Melbourne, they're all very massive masonry buildings that are blocks with openings in them and then mouldings around the openings to try and look three-dimensional. We're more interested in the sculpture coming out of America in the 60s and 70s where simple form with light on it made the three-dimensional quality and it is what it is and our work is never decorated. It is the form and the materiality of the work that gives it its character. I'd never been into a home that was anything like this. Um, and so I could understand why people that came here were a bit confronted by the idea that um, this works as a home. And you know, a common, a common complaint was, well, isn't it cold? I go, well, no, it's got heating, so it's not cold, and, and the space is not cold. Um, you know, it's lived in by the people, and it's no different to, to any other home. It was a, it was a fairly significant undertaking for us. I mean, the, the building of the house and financially as well. So we saw it as a, um, it was, in a way, it's a lifestyle choice. We didn't, we didn't um, commission the building of the house so that we could sell it in 10 years time and then move on to the next one. Um, that really wasn't the idea. The idea was that we're investing in a home to live in. And uh, it's a cost, but it also has a value in, in how you live and how you want to live. And I guess we, we got what we asked for. Um, and so you think, even now, why would we look for anything different? We're happy here and every time you walk through, um, almost every season, the light is different. The house looks different. You experience it a different way, even though so little has changed. Uh, we still have a very good relationship with our clients and Joe and Pisa ring up once a year and just say, I love the house and hang up. I know we're thrilled with, with the outcome. And I think when you look at a typical suburban block of land in North Caulfield and think what, what is possible, Joe and Pisa made us push ourselves to realise something that I think doesn't exist anywhere else. At the time that we did the apartment, Surrey Hills was a very different place. It was a very different place. It was actually, and it looked to some extent it still is quite a tough neighbourhood, but it's softened up a lot. It's much more hip and much more sort of humanised now. A group of friends owned the building and they had decided to renovate it together. Yeah, it was five floors of apartments and they owned them, um, different members of the group owned different floors. And we were asked to do actually a renovation that allowed them to occupy them was really floor by floor, strata, bring it up to date, deal with the car parking. It was quite a pragmatic job. Some of the people wanted us to do the whole fit out and floor for them and some didn't, some just wanted the shell. And so that's the way it began. I guess the, the traditional way of building in an urban environment is to build to the edges. You know, you go up to your edge, the site, there's no setbacks or requirements to have setbacks. But because of the pocket of the kind of bucket of space that we had, we couldn't fill the whole floor at the top. And so we weren't talking about just an extrusion at another floor. We had to, in a way, add both open space and indoor space. And that's how the design really began, was, well, how do you add something that doesn't just look like it's always been there, because it can't just simply continue with another full floor? What are you making then? Are you making a roof? Are you making a courtyard building? Are you making something that completely retreats from the edges and is invisible? So it's really that moment of knowing that we were going to make an outdoor space and an indoor space drove a kind of re-look at what's the relationship between something new and a beautiful, robust brick warehouse. I think, we, you know, everybody loves Paris, but there is that idea in Paris that there are walls of buildings, and then above the wall is a kind of playful roof um, zone where people do quite wild things in actually quite an old city, and it, they never jar. There's a kind of other geometry that takes over, and I think that's where we started to think about 
a, it was a way of thinking about being above the parapet line that could be more playful, could be more sort of unusual, and yet somehow it would be held together by that thinking. Look, I think if you looked at the, the footprint of the site itself, it's a very unusual geometry. And um, we kind of like that. We quite like difficult geometries because it gives you an, a, a sort of way of resolving things slightly smoothly. Um, and so there are, technically there's kind of three bands, there's the outdoor space, the big room, and then the smaller spaces and the staircase. But actually the way they are hinged is because of the pinch point at the tip of the site, which actually allows them to sort of flare and um, wrap around each other. I think it's a general kind of feeling of, in this case, something that seemed tough from the outside and something that was much softer. It's sort of a soft-shelled, a kind of something that has a, an armature that protects you from the outside, but from the inside it's something else entirely. That you do feel, not that you're in a tough neighbourhood, but that you're in a very gentle and, and humane sort of space. The owners, Daniel Droger and Lyndall Droger, still own the building now after 15 years. He, he moved in here. Um, he lived here for much longer than that. He lived here before the building was renovated. And it suited a, you know, a young couple. Um, it suited them up to the point where they had one child. So I wasn't surprised. I wouldn't have been surprised if he'd moved on at that point. But he moved his office here. and. Um, and then he rented it to friends and it was used to live work in various different ways. It was a fantastic food photographer here for a while. And then he's now donated it to the Institute of Architects for an architect in residence, which, I mean, it's, for us it's fantastic to see that one space can have so many lives. It was interesting revisiting these houses, you know, often decades after they were built, um, so that they'd have plenty of time to develop a patina and character all, all of their own. And there is this wonderful quote from Rick Laplastre that houses aren't um, at their best when just built, that it is kind of with love and time that they become more beautiful. And I see that time and time again in the houses that I, I've visited, especially if they've been with um, the original owner. Um, and, and they often and get these houses people who love them and they're not the original owner not many have passed through too many hands and I think that's part of the secret to um, to that kind of development is is the care that, that people take with these places they know they're special and um, they're very sensitive to how they how they live in them